Welcome to another edition of the Marty Chronicles, part of the conservative take. Uh, I'm joined again today by Bob Schaefer. Uh, Bob, thanks for th your time today. We'll uh, sure. get right yeah, to you back, Thanks here. for having me on, Marty. Sure. Bob, you know, um, economists, my background is actually in economics. That's, that's my college background. And economists tend to um, view things or describe things in macro terms, which would be like a, a, a country's economy versus micro terms, which would be like your household economy. Right. One's not better than the other. It's just a way of, 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 you know, cutting through everything. And that's one of the reasons I really have enjoyed hearing from you on this, because on a macro scale, you were co-chair of the Congressional Ukrainian Caucus. So you had a lot of that more global um, impact and, and decisions on things like that. But you also have a micro side to it in that your your mom is a Ukrainian immigrant, right? Yes, she's she's from Canada, uh, but uh, of U Ukrainian heritage, right? Her village went from Canada to yeah. Ukraine, Ukraine or, uh, from Canada from Ukraine to Canada, Canada to the U.S. Yeah, and my point simply being that for you for describing this, um, that gives you kind of that macro worldview and the micro personal view is is right. really my reason for bringing it up. When we talked last week, the fighting had just started. Literally, it had just started. We're five days into it now. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on what you've seen. Anything unusual or unexpected? And, and Bob, there, there seems to be a lot of misinformation or maybe disinformation um, that's very puzzling to a lot of people. So I'm going to turn it over to you for your thoughts on what's gone on over the past five days. Yeah, well, I think the surprising thing um, depending on one's point of view, is the uh, is the ability of the Ukrainians to stand their ground. Uh, I think it was assumed, and I think Putin probably assumed himself that uh, and persuaded his warriors that it would be a uh, an overwhelming incursion, and that would result in immediate in cities immediately falling throughout Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians throwing up their hands and surrendering. But there does not seem to be anywhere near that. There, in fact. Um, the the fighting of the Ukrainian military is uh, has has been a little more proficient, robust, and I think the the world expected. And just the sheer numbers of Ukrainians who are willing to stand their ground and and not flee. And there are some, without a doubt. You're seeing columns of people leaving, um, but you know those are families. Those are those are people trying to get their babies and their grandparents out of the sure. country or to some sure. safer place. But huge numbers of Ukrainians are are. Um, Taking to uh, you know whatever uh, what, whatever resources they have at their capacity to survive, to outlast, and to overwhelm um, Russian Russian forces. Uh, they may not have superior arms, uh, but um, what the Ukrainian military is doing a proficient job, and and two millions of Ukrainians are willing to fight back. So I think that's uh, I, you know for those who know Ukrainians, that's not surprising. That that is the story right. of. The history after Ukraine being invaded oh, century after century, uh, you know, there still is Ukraine, and and this is how that has been achieved. So uh, that's not so much of a surprise. Um, but yeah, the disinformation you mentioned, there is a lot of that uh, on uh, on both sides. I would say, uh, both being you know the the, the pro Ukrainian um, stories. Uh, you know, there are there are the, the, there's the story of the uh, the you know the ghost Air Force pilot. That is, uh, you know, shooting down Russian MIGs left and right, and um, you know that's not been confirmed by the Ukrainian military and uh, or the Ukrainian Air Force, and you know that's a interesting story that might have been totally fabricated, but it's being circulated around the internet and uh, on Twitter and social media and so on, and it has is serving a purpose of rallying Ukrainians to some sense of of hope. Um, you know that may not be true. And uh, and so so that's just one example. There are probably dozens that I've seen. Uh, I, I saw um, some armored personnel carriers being um, attacked by Ukrainians successfully. Well, I I happen to remember seeing that video from six or seven years ago, um, and that was uh, that was a different activity. And those were actually Ukrainian APCs that were being attacked at the time by uh, people in the street. So you know you're seeing old video like that. Um, that is being recirculated and, and portrayed as though it just happened yesterday, and it's just not true. 
Yeah, who do you think is doing that? I mean, uh, you, you mentioned a valid point, rallying the troops, but it's really bizarre. You know, the, the Snake Island, you know, that the, the people that supposedly cussed out the Russian ship and now the story is no, they actually surrendered. I mean, who, I mean, where do these stories, wh who benefits from? Um, I, it, it's hard to say. There, it's I. I think there. You just have millions of people around the world who are just like me, just like you, who care about Ukraine, who choose the side of Ukrainians. Typically, uh, presumably, there are some around the world who are sympathetic to the Russian cause here, and so you've just got a lot of people with access to communication networks, just like we are right now, and um, you know the tendency for people along the way to put together a narrative that they think is helpful to the cause and see if they can get it to go viral. It, that's not, that's probably not coming with from a single point or from a single um, uh, objective by, uh, you know, a particular group. And, and just, uh, just from a military point of view, neither one of us is a military person. So I'm not going to go far with this, but I have a friend who is retired military combat and um, in leadership. And he had told me at the beginning what he anticipated was that uh, the Russian forces would really sort of ignore the big cities. They would go to the countryside instead, cut off supply lines and things like that. So he's been puzzled that the effort has been this, let's take down Kiev in one big swoop. Uh, it just, it seems kind of curious, that's all. Yeah, I, uh, well... There's lots of ways to get around in Ukraine. You know, there's it's uh, there's lots of roads, lots of routes, and Ukrainians. You know, Ukrainians are. Um, you know, you, you keep in mind Ukrainians have are practiced in these kinds of tactics of getting resources to where they need to be. I, I saw this way back in uh, the Orange Revolution. What was that? 2004, I think it was the Orange Revolution when the Ukrainian government tried to shut down the city of Kiev because you had. Um, citizens that were pouring in from the countryside trying to get into the city. And so, yeah, the Ukrainian government was trying to resist that. And uh, the and, and this was the uprising, the revolution. So it was the people versus their government at the time. And, uh, and, and the people found pretty easily and in very clever and impressive ways, found ways to get food, resources, housing, uh, medical care, and, uh, and people uh, to mobilize in Kiev by the millions. And it was an impressive uh, it was an impressive undertaking at the time. So they know how to clear roads. They know how to uh, cut new roads um, in a matter of hours. And they, they know how to bypass these. I, I, you know, look, the advantage Ukrainians have is that this is their homeland. They know the territory. They know the people. They can communicate uh, much better. And this is, this is the, the lesson of, of history. The um, you know, those who are defending their homeland always have uh, a, a particular advantage. A, t a tactical advantage in a lot of cases. Yeah. You can go back to the American Revolution, uh, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and many more. So Absolutely. you're right. You're yeah. right. I'm curious, from a sanction point of view, do you see that having an impact on the Russians? Um, one of the things that jumps out at me, and if you know better, if I'm incorrect, let me know, but everyone still seems to be buying Russian oil. So if if that's the case... I'm not sure sanctions are really going to be that effective. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. There's no doubt about it. There, there are um, uh, sanctions are never a good idea in the aggregate, but I, I do think that at times of war, they they often provide tactical advantages, and hopefully, they are um, accomplished. Th their effect can be realized in the short term. Uh, yeah, because you know, trade, cutting off trade and embargoes. Here, here's the double-edged sword. We we definitely want to punish Putin and his oligarch cronies. We want to shut off their money supply. We want to separate them from the wealth that allows them to sustain a an an oligarch-supported dictatorship and uh, allows this um, evil and vile uh, violence that is taking place. We want to we want to you, you the world should be aggressive about shutting down those resources, but. Uh, you know, think of this. There, there are people engaged in business and commerce in Russia right now who might be inclined to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Well, sanctions against Russia shuts off that guy as well. Let's imagine a merchant or a restaurant owner or a store owner or a farmer who uh, whose livelihood is now perhaps becomes more dependent on the Russian state rather than um, 
independence that is secured through through trade. So, um, you know, the, 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 so that's the double edged sword. Putin and his oligarch cronies are uh, heads of a state, a, of, a, of a sovereign nation of Russia. And so their bad actions need to be dealt with in ways that unfortunately will punish the good guys. And, um, and whether those are whether those are uh, those who are inclined toward <clears throat> revolution in Russia, um, or uh, others throughout throughout the world who will be similarly harmed, and and yes, uh, there is a I wouldn't say dependency, but there is a reliance on um, Russian oil as a certain percentage of of global uh, energy supply, natural gas and oil being uh, being among them. Um, but that is also the economic lifeline to Russia. So um, I, I think in that, I, I am in favor of shutting down Russia's ability to generate, uh, the Russian government's ability to generate income. I, I think that is prudent at this point in time. That puts, uh, the, you know, I mentioned this oligarch class. I mean, if, if you just, I mean, imagine a few hundred uh, millionaires, billionaires who are part of Putin's inner circle and communicating with him on a daily uh, basis. Yeah, if those people are hurting, they're going to be communicating to their friend, the president, saying maybe we took it too far, maybe we should back off. And I take the, take it as a good sign that there are some efforts toward negotiation that have uh, uh, exhibited uh, that have come to the surface today. Don't have high hopes for them, but one never knows. Um, talking is always better than shooting, and and uh, so both are going on. But you should never give up an opportunity for dialogue. So I I do think that that uh, applied properly and correctly. And I'm I'm just not in the circles that I used to be in when I was a member of Congress and have privy to the secret briefings on exactly who these actors are, who are specific oligarchs being targeted. But I do know that uh, when competent people are can be. Um, empowered uh, to wage that kind of an economic, um, the, the economic part of, of warfare, it can be done proficiently and effectively and bring a, a quicker conclusion to the war. It did in the Second World War against Hitler, ultimately, and um, the conclusion of the Cold War, in the end, was an economic and cultural um, chess match. Um, so uh, based on what I know and what I'm what I'm reading, yeah, I've got concerns about all of these. Uh, the, you know, the 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 call for um, you know complete and total uh, embargoes. I could go along with that for a short period of time, but we have to keep in mind the Russian people who need to be supported so that they can be the leaders of a new Russia, a new that is more democratic and less beholden to an oligarchic uh, dictatorship. One last thing on the sanctions, and then we'll move on, but this is just my observation. You know I'm into central banks and things like that. I, I always have been. And the Russian central bank is one of six or seven kind of renegade central banks. There's The rest of the countries are part of a network that a lot of times is just re referred to as the Rothschild network. And Russia is not part of that. And so when, when you try to impose um, I'm not sure. It, will it hurt those people you just described? Of course it will. But I'm not sure it's going to hurt the Vladimir Putins and, and or, or not as quickly as it might have in other cases. So keep an eye on that. I want to get to something else real quick, though, Bob. Last week, when we were talking about this, you mentioned uh, Zelensky, the, the um, Ukraine leader. And you just, I believe the, 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 the phrase was, he's not a good leader. And Kind of expand on that. What do you mean by he's not a good? He's not friendly to us. He's not. What What do you mean by that? Well, I well, I said he's no great great statesman or no great leader. Maybe something on that that order. I, he might be a good guy. I, I have never sure. met him. I have no experience with him. Um, my my point being is that he had very little experience in um, governing. I think he had no experience in governing leading up to him becoming uh, the president of the country. Other than he played one on TV. Uh, he's an actor. He's a comedian, and he uh, he. Uh, I, I've not seen the show, so maybe I'm not being fair or uh, or uh, charitable. I, I understand he, he played a show where he was, I think, a school teacher, and ends up becoming going from school teacher to becoming the president. And it's a it's a, you know, it's a funny show. He's a, he's the comic in it, and uh, it's a lot like the the Office that we know here in the the, the sitcom, The Office. 
um, and he's kind of like the Michael Scott of uh, uh, the Michael Scott of uh, of, of uh, East European politics in that in, in this this show. Well, it was popular, and he's a good actor, and so um, the Ukrainians and he ran on a no. Um, anti-corruption platform as they all do in in ukraine and he won he won he was he was popular and well known he was the arnold schwarzenegger i suppose of of ukraine you know um, goes from the big screen to uh or the television screen in this case to um becoming president of the country so that and and i i think when when you look at his his track record his speeches his uh, interaction even with donald trump early on in his administration you just see one blunder after another not major but this is this is not he he's he's not um, he he's he, he's not the experienced seasoned proficient national leader that uh, Ukraine has needed. Now, having said that, um, I agree with the Wall Street Journal's assessment. I think Saturday and Saturday's edition that he has stepped into the occasion fairly nicely. And I, I got to tell you, I'm really impressed with uh, 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 former. Uh, President Peter Poroshenko, for example, who is his political rival right now, uh, Zelensky's political rival, coming together and saying he's our leader now. We are behind him. We are standing behind Zelensky. And the Ukrainian U Ukrainian politics is pretty cutthroat. These guys are at each other's necks. They throw each other in jail, and and sometimes there's assassinations that take place. That's kind of the history of Ukrainian politics, uh, as it is Eastern European politics. And uh, these Ukrainian leaders and parties seem to be rallying around Zelensky as their spokesman today. And that is the thing that I think is impressive. There's a nice lesson in that for Americans, frankly, that in times of war, um, yeah, think what you think about the political background or uh, insufficiencies or inadequacies of your political rivals. But when you've got uh, your sons and daughters in harm's way and uh, paying the ultimate sacrifice for their national patriotism, uh, that is not the time to undermine the the the, um, the the political stature of your president. You want to reinforce it. And I see Ukrainians doing that. And frankly, I see Zelensky rising to the occasion um, and showing strength, showing courage. And he's uh, he's being an, he's turning out to be an inspiring um, spokesman for his country. Uh, so my open question is, and I think the world's open question is, he has proposed negotiations, uh, a meeting with the Russians. The Russians have said they are willing to meet in Belarus. Um, that may be taken, may have taken place already today, or or it will take place in hours. Um, I've just got to wonder. Boy, he's got to he's got to have his A game on, and uh, and it's possible he's an attorney by training, so you know you, you ex assume that he's got some capacity and ability to negotiate effectively. Uh, but this is going to be his moment to determine the future of his country, and um, you know whether he can bring this conflict uh, to a conclusion. Let's contrast that with Vladimir Putin. Um, I've seen pundits actually suggest that he is mentally unstable as a result of COVID, old age, or whatever. Um, and I'm just curious, is, is Putin behaving as you would have expected? Senator Rubio, for example, has sent out a nebulous tweets uh, about Putin suggesting there is something coming, there's something happening. I'm just curious, do you see him acting erratically? Is he outside the realm of what you would have expected him to do? Yes, but not recently. I, or not, 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 that's not just a recent observation. I, I have think, um, just in my observation, I met Putin uh, once and uh, that was in 2000, I think it was. Uh, it was 2001. I met him in Kiev for the 10th anniversary of uh, Ukraine's independence. Then had a brief conversation with him about the anti-ballistic missile treaty. <laughs> it didn't didn't last very long, but uh, no <laughs> <laughs> but I did have a short uh, conversation, just meeting him. And and uh, uh, all right, well. Yeah, I do believe Putin's delusional. Whether that can be attributable to some um, some medical condition or mental health condition, I, I don't know. I think he is overwhelmed by pride, his own pride, his own. Uh, um, I, I would even attribute it to being um, a low personal self esteem. Um, people think that's odd, but I think that's true. And and I and I, and I think the reason you see such bravado in his uh, character over the years, you know, right, the shirtless uh, president riding a horse and not the other things, wrestler and, and uh, or uh, judo um, 
practitioner and, and so on is uh, is uh, you know that that I, I think that's all compensation for what is otherwise a, a pretty low self esteem in a leader and and those are the just like Hitler and others those are leaders that end up becoming the worst kind of tyrants. I, I think he is at a point where he views his legacy as president of Ukraine maybe coming to an end given his age. Um, that his legacy of, of Ukraine, he does not want to die being some kind of a failure or uh, appearing weak in any way. And so, yeah, I do believe he is acting irrationally. I think the invasion of Ukraine is irrational. He, it was right. not provoked. He changed the narrative in the months and weeks leading up to this attack, indicating he knew this was an aggressive action that he, in the back of his head, was always planning to uh, uh, to undertake. And um he, he was willing, there was a cognitive dissonance that was on full display. He was willing to change the narrative, try to alter history and redefine history as justification for killing Ukrainians and invading a country. Um, I, I think that's what's driving him is pride. And, um, you know, pride is you know, one of the seven deadly sins and, and maybe others as well that uh, he would be guilty, guilty of. But, you know, there, there is a traditional and customary Moscow pride, as it is called, um, you know, Secret uh, Secretary of State Zbigniew Brzezinski used to talk about it all the time and and lament that Americans and Europeans don't understand it uh, quite well. I mean, Russians have a, a a glorious history, the Russian people, and a, a wonderful legacy, and great literature, and great history, and a great culture. And uh, and whenever that, whenever they are offended or feel undermined in any way, um, you know, Russians really embrace that legacy, especially those who are the appointed representatives of that country. So, you know, understanding that that aspect of Russian culture and um, and and then analyzing how that manifests itself in the mind of um, the dictator Vladimir Putin. Um, I yeah, I do think he is prone to irrational uh, behavior and I do believe he's de delusional. And so the, I am one who's concerned. I, I am concerned about the it, where this goes in its extremes. I mean, he has um, marshaled his uh, his nuclear warfare fo uh, forces and put them on high alert. Um, and I've heard people. I was even been on a conversation today where uh, some on the call said, you know, he'll never go to the extreme of pushing the the red button on uh, his nuclear launch sequence. I I frankly am not so sure. I, I think he may be back, given that the war in Ukraine is not going particularly well, at least as well as he thought. I, I hear he has Russian generals who are who were not in favor of invading Ukraine in the first place that are kind of giving him the I told you so speeches back at the right. Kremlin. And uh, his finances are drying up. I, I think this is not going very well. And you look at what options he has left, and they are uglier than the options he's pursued already. Do you, and you, I'm not suggesting you have any firsthand knowledge of this, but would you suspect he has support in the Ukraine? And I certainly don't mean the farmer and, and the merchant, those billionaires that uh, that we talked about that uh, get created in you either Russia. Yeah. You mean you, you support in Russia? In, in, in Ukraine. Support in Ukraine. But among the among the wealthy oligarchs. Yes, he has. He, he clearly has some. And we know this uh, going back to the... Uh, well, the Orange Revolution and then the uh, election of Viktor Yanukovych after him. You know, Yanukovych was supported by this oligarch class. And uh, I, I was there as an election monitor back in those uh, uh, those years. Um, so this was after, after Viktor Yushchenko, then Yanukovych runs and wins. And, um, you know, Ukrainian campaigns are low dollar campaigns. Uh, they, they, you literally pick a color. That's where these colors come from. The orange yep. revolution. Well, that was the color of Viktor Yushchenko and the, the our Ukraine uh, party. Uh, the the uh, party of regions, the Viktor Yanukovych's party was blue and white. So, uh, but on the second time when I went back, the blue and white party, boy, they were on TV. They had billboards. They were on air. They had, uh, you know, uh, just, just in a, an American style campaign that took place, in, including an American campaign manager named Paul Manafort, who Americans should know. He ended up working for the Trump administration and is uh, right. behind bars, I think, still as a result of yeah, undisclosed yeah. income. Yeah. Uh, so so Yushink, or Yanukovych was funded by Russia and these pro-Russian oligarchs in Ukraine. So um, we, we know that there is 
yeah, I mean, this has been the Russian way. This is how Cry the, the, the politicians in Ukraine and Crimea um, so eventually came to the conclusion that they wanted their independence and they wanted to align with Russia. Well, these were not Ukrainians. The Ukrainians were run out of town by Russian backed par politicians that ended up getting elected to be the governor and the mayors of the cities and so on and so forth. And they made life so unbearable for the Ukrainians that they left and then they held a vote. Oh, who wants to be independent and aligned with Russia? Well, of course, the non-Ukrainians who are left um, and ethnic Russians sure. in many cases, they uh, they align with with Russia. So, yes, there there clearly are um, Ukrainian oligarchs, some of the top, quote unquote, businesses. Th these are the old communists that um, after the fall of communist uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, cloaked themselves as the new capitalists and they were the only ones with money, so they bought up all the railroads and the utilities and the businesses um, for pennies on the dollar and became the oligarch class of uh, Ukraine, of the Eastern Soviet Union, of, of Eastern Europe as we know it today. And yes, most of them, their fortunes were made based on their alliances and allegiances to Moscow, whereas the rest of these countries see their future as uh, being aligned with the West. Bob, one more question and I'll let you go. You mentioned uh, potential peace talks. We don't know if they're happening as we speak, if they're scheduled. Forget about that for just a second. What would you anticipate in the next week, the next two days? What, what would you expect to happen in the, over the next few days? Um, well, again, it's, uh, I, I, uh, I, I would, I, um, I don't know that I expect these dialogues to result in anything positive immediately. I uh, imagine that they probably will result in another set of talks in a, in a week or so from now, or uh, over the course of a, a week, a week or so. Um, I just don't. I'm just not hearing from my friends, from my contacts, that there is any indication that Putin is uh, backing away from the Rubicon that he's crossed or wanting to go back. He, he has committed a, an act of war, the likes of which have not been seen since World War II. And um, after one week, I don't think his resolve has been shaken to the point where he's willing to surrender or suggest that he, is, um, he, he has failed. But I know that that cascade of discussions is taking place within the Kremlin and with the Russian Defense Department. And there is a lot of second guessing going on. Um, which if Ukrainians can hold their own in the street and the rest of the Western world can apply, uh, provide support, that's military support, um, humanitarian support, uh, assist in evacuations and providing uh, safe shelter for those who need to temporarily be out of their country. If the rest of the world can rally in that way and cut off the resources, um, incoming resources for, for income of, uh, Putin and his closest friends, yeah, they've got, they have a resource supply. They've got a lot of gold. They've got a lot of savings, but um, that won't last a long time when you're talking about an engagement of some hundreds of thousands of troops in a, a uh, in a um, an expeditionary mission like this. Uh, expeditionary mission like this. It's expensive. It, you can't sustain it very long, even with all of Russia's with the wealth that Russia and Putin has. So. We're, I, I, I do think that we're either going to see some positive signs within five days, uh, let's say by Friday, uh, or we're going to see tr very troubling signs of escalation that tell us that uh, the rest of Europe and maybe right here in the United States need to hunker down for the kind of warfare we have always feared, and that is long-range missiles. And then there's China. You can't forget about China, too. China's looking That's for weakness as well. That's a subject for another another meeting, perhaps. But you're absolutely right. That's that is a big part of it. We haven't touched on it at all, and that's my fault. But you're absolutely right about that. Um, hopefully we can get to that another time. All right. I'd love to. Bob, thank you as always. I appreciate your joining us. Uh, everybody that has has viewed what we've talked about has been excited about what you've had to say. So thank you again. You've watched another edition of the Marty Chronicles on the conservative take. See you next time.